You like the music? Yes. Well, now it's a great honor and joy for me to welcome a man who throughout his political life has fought for the people who suffer the most. We are proud that former Prime Minister, Chairman of the European Social Democrats, Member of the European Parliament, Paul Nyrup Rasmussen, is with us today to send the Congress a greeting. And I must say to you that not from Denmark, the Danish know it already, we have over the past eight years missed a government leader of your kind, Paul, with your view of humanity. Yes, it was under your leadership that Denmark changes the social legislation to benefit the people that social educators work with every day. And these changes we still today have to be proud of. Welcome, Paul. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Right. I just need a few instructions and then I'm here. And could I have any more beautiful instruction that from this lady, right? Can someone please tell us how this Yeah, we, we, we will make a try. Let me see. Let me see, right? Next, next. Do you see anything I don't? Hmm? There you go. There we go. So, there we go. Now, these kids, these young people, they are mine too. I, I just want to tell you, Bo Sherlock was a man who, a century ago, at least in my lifetime, has grown up, took the initiative to create these wonderful chorus you just enjoyed. Uh, they are coming from, as you know, uh, one of the poorer quartiers here in Copenhagen, and they really, really tells us, tells us what spirit, what cohesion, what friendship what being on a team is, and, and let this be my, my, first, my first remark to you today. What I want to do now is to try, if I can find out, here we go, to, to give you a feeling on what's going on outside ordinary people's power. Because talking about a new globalization by putting people first and trying, to be or to create circumstances where globalization can make us stronger, that's quite a challenge, I would say. Uh, so what I will do, do is, number one, to give you a picture of what's going on on what you could call the, the real economic power level and what can we do about it. And secondly, of course, trying to, to uh, give you a vision on what can be done. So let us try. To, uh, to look at this one. Can I move this? Can you move this a little bit down? Can you do that so that people can see? Just move it a bit, bit down, those of you who control this technology, right? Not upwards, but downwards, right? Can you do that? No, you can't. Are you awake up there? <laughs> yes, you are. Okay. Then what, what I want to, to show to you with this one first is that, that globalization have on the one hand, without any doubt, giving us uh, a lot of wealth, money, but unfortunately only for the richer part of the world. The poorer part of the world have de facto, if we take the 39 poorest nations in the world being po poorer as a consequence of the globalization. So, friends, we are in a dilemma in the sense that we cannot say goodbye to globalization, do not come again. Globalization is here to stay. So it's about framing globalization our way, uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about. You can't say that the ultimate level right now for globalization is what I would call uh, marketing, marketing, marketing. The market power have taken over uh, for nearly 20 years now. What we see in the global economy and in the globalization is the ultimate mark sharing, you could say. So what we have in front of us is an un unregulated market economy without any face, without any soul, without any, anyone you could talk about getting things done. The tempo is exponential now. One of the most heavy consequences of globalization is that 
the tempo is so high as it is. You will see that in our parents' time, you could count on that your father or mother, yeah, they were getting unemployed for the time being, but then they came back more or less to the same job. But now you have to change job 10, 15, 20 times as many times as your father and mother did at that time. So the tempo is exponential. It's increasing all the time, and it's here to, change, to stay, which means change, permanent change. And you know and I know that people don't like change. Well, I do. But, but, I mean, I'm talking about all those who have their ordinary life, who live in the villages, in the poorest part of the world, or in the richer part of the world. They don't like change. Change of this character, which you're not a part of, but which is imposed on you, is creating unfeelingness, is creating uncertainty. The old jobs are changing with the new jobs. That's good for the economy and for our wealth, but it's also a question of, can, what about my soul? Can I manage? What about my kids? Can they have the new jobs, the new education I want them to have? And what about, what about the vulnerable children? So consequences of globalization is also that inclusion at a time leads to exclusion and leads to explanations and leads to poverty in, an, in, in a broader sense. Bill Clinton have formulated these three points which, which characterize our modern globalization. It's inequality, it's instability, and it's unsustainability. And if we take this difference to the old world, and if we take it just inequality first, you will see that the consequences among people within nations, among nations, among regions, is that the differences are getting higher and higher and longer and longer. You, we see it here in, in, in this wonderful part of the world, this little Denmark, that just in the eight times we have had another government, my God, the difference between those who have and those who have not is really, really, really in expanding. And that goes, of course, also with, within nations and that goes uh, within regions. So inequality is the first. Instability is the next. I mean, you know what you, what you have seen in the latest years. The wars and the conflicts have changed characters, but they are still there. The ethnic minorities are still oppressed, are still undermined, are, are still treated, even in Europe, if we look around in a bad way. Not to talk about Africa, not to talk about Latin America or US for that case. Migrants and refugees, uh, privatization of our wealth. This little country, Denmark, together with Sweden and Finland and Norway, have for years been proud of having a public sector which is delivering, not least on, on the health side. Now we see that a privatization of the public sector is beginning to undermine the solidarity and the coherence in our service to ordinary people. And the financial crisis and economic crisis have just come at the top of this instability we have seen. And those who pay the price, children, youth, the traumas, the extreme mortality rates, the war traumas, the loneliness, the abuse, the slavery, to take the most extreme things. Wanted is a new global governance which takes care of the framing of the market forces. Now, the unsustainability, I just want to end with these, these three uh, characteristics with the modern world, is, of course, this planet's climate uh, crisis. The storms, the deserts, the increase in, in temperature, you know it yourself, the water pollution, the natural disasters, uh, and, and scarce, scarcity of good natural resources, you know it. Uh, it's about bailing out, if you like, uh, this planet instead of only focusing on bailing out our banks. So again, the most suffering parts of the world are the developing countries and children and youth. So that's why we need not only to say, well, let's make the 2020 20, which means in year 2020, we are going to reduce our energy consumption with 20%, and we're going to reduce our CO2 emission with 20%, and we're going to increase uh, our, um, you could say, sustainable energy resources as a part of our total consumption with 20%. That's good to say. And it is possible to do in the richer part, but in the poorer part, we can't do it without also being economic, solidarity-oriented at the end of the day. 
Friends, I need to say a few words about the economic crisis to understand the character of our challenge now. It's serious, it's bad, and it's getting worse. And I, I mean, you don't need to get the nice, the nice stories, you need to get the facts. The facts are the following, that we are getting this year something on, on the globe as a whole, a minus growth rate of about 3%. But if you take the richer part, you can easily see that it's, it's really, really bad. Alone in the European Union, we're getting, at the end of this year, 27 million unemployed. Which means that 10 million people in the last two years, this year and next year, will lose their job at the top of those who have already lost it. And, and it's, it's also true that one thing is the richer part of the planet. If you take the poorer parts, you can see that already now, according to the ILO, we have lost around 50 million uh, people, uh, lost their jobs. Which again, at the top of the character we had on the globalization means that the poorer part is becoming even more poor, uh, that those children who dreamt of having an education are getting even more worse. Those not to blame are those who take the heaviest part of the burdens. We, we therefore need to, to, uh, to take real tools on board to be sure that this time, this time we are going to frame the market economy in a more effective way than we've done in the past. That's what I'm investing a lot of energy in, together with my American friends, in the new leadership with the White House, but also the Democratic majority in House and Congress. What we need to understand, number one, is that for too long time, I would say 25 years, the financial market have controlled the real economy or the real world and not the other way around. I mean, the financial markets are the ones who are financing our investments, our needs, uh, who are using our saving to transform this saving to financial uh, capability. Problem that the speculation in the latest eight years have been enormous. Do you know that the so-called credit derivatives, that means sliced loans which are packed with other sliced loans, which are again in complexity, packed with other sliced loans, where you cannot see the, con the, the, the connection between price and risk, and, and you try to think what is the real value of all these demands and products. Do you know that these products, which we call credit derivatives, these products at the peak before we got the bubble burst last year was around four times this planet's gross national product. So you can easily understand that the paper dealing uh, was, was immense and, and there was just a feeling in Wall Street and in London City that, well, as long as the party is going on, we need to be a part of the party. As someone said, if you're dancing, you need to dance. Nobody imagined that, of course, at a certain time, it would all break down because it's, it's impossible. You don't need to be mathematical economists to understand that. It's impossible to have a growth rate in speculative products of 20% a year and at the same time a real economic growth rate of about two, three, four percent. It's impossible. At a certain time it will break down. So that's why it did. And that's why we need to understand that now it's time to turn the other way around and again ensure that the financial market is the servant of the real economy and not as, as it had been for too long uh, the master. Turning to a new future and turning and that's why we talk about regulation of the financial market. It's also important that you know uh, the factors, the financial actors, before we, we, we go to, to people's world. This world here is the world who have decided. And there has been a tendency, dear friends, to say, well, it's all the Americans' mistakes. It's, these, it's so easy to say, you know, it's America, right? It's Bush. Well, partly, yes, but not the whole truth. You know, this, the case is that the subprime market crisis, the American housing market, when this market broke down, this was rather a trigger than the explanation to all of it. Let me just give you two figures. This market, the home subprime market in US, is about $1.5 trillion, uh, $1.5 billion, right? But the whole, you know, the whole market of products I talked with you of before, the credit 
uh, market, the credit derivatives, that's about $62 trillion. You got it? So 1.5 for the American single mother with two kids and 62 for the whole project speculative market. That's just to give you the explanation why the subprime market crisis in U.S. was the trigger and not the whole explanation. Dear colleagues and friends, we were all, they were all in the same boat. They all contributed to this building up of the bubble burst of the credit crisis. Whether they were investment bankers or they were private equity leveraging companies and selling them after five years to get some extreme return, or they were hedge funds, or they were credit rating agencies, they were all in that same boat. And they all contributed to the collapse of the credit bubble. This is why the UBS in Switzerland, Deutsche Bank in Deutschland, the Danske Bank in Denmark, they all had problems. To those of you who have followed this country, as a managing director of the Danske Bank, the biggest one in Denmark, he's not sleeping well these days. He's not sleeping well. You know why? Because he's worried. Each morning when he's awake, he asks himself, are we, still, are we still liquid in my bank or are we bankrupt you now? You know why? Because on his balance, on his balance, there's a huge amount of credit derivatives I told you about before. And this guy don't know whether in next morning half of his loans he have, he have been giving companies and speculators are not only half worth but zero worth. That is why, you see, that is why it takes such long time. And that is why Obama tries with taxpayers' money and without to get, to get these banks under control. And that is why Europe and, and Latin America try to get the banks under control. The only way of doing it is to isolate these bad loans and try to make good banking again. And for God's sake, begin to make some claims to these banking directors. Begin to say to them, listen, if you're driving your bank down, you have to take responsibility and not, not just continue with your bonuses and your stock options, right? <laughs> Let's get some fairness. And and all this, all this is underway now, and that's why I'm talking so fast and I'm so energetic to try to show you how important things are. Let, let us just take, take this what to do now. <laughs> on the regulation side, I must have your support of what's going on now. My ambition and ours in the European social democracy is to make Europe the front runner on regulation uh, and on, on what to do. Let's just go back just one second, this one. What we need to do in Europe, in US, in your D20 next time in September in New York and globally is to get regulation now. You know, for too long time, private equity and hedge funds have been living in a black box without any monitoring, without any transparency, without anyone who knew what was going on. Do you know, friends, that just one year ago, in 132 skyscrapers, mainly in Wall Street, in London City, and in Frankfurt, and in, in Hong Kong partly, and in Japan, in 132 skyscrapers, they took decisions, these managers, on money for more than half of this world's financial market. So in 132 offices, they were taking decisions each day which had far-reaching consequ consequences for millions and millions and millions of ordinary people. This is, of course, not acceptable. That's why now the door is open for regulation and we need to be there. Transparency, responsibility, long-term financing, and I take it, they have to pay tax also, you know. They have to pay tax also, right? They have to pay tax. <laughs> Do you know do you know that if these guys paid their taxes, right? If they paid taxes, do you know what that is equal to? We could not only finance millennium goals to get rid of half of the poverty in this world. We could get rid of all of it. We're talking of an immense amount of money where it's day by day, month by month, year by year is slipping away through Cayman Island, through many, many other para tax paradises. This must stop now, dear friends. There was a private equity manager who said, 
at the front page of Financial Times, yes, I pay less in tax than my cleaning lady. Yeah? What a guy. Huh? What a guy. What a lack of respect. So they have to take their taxes, pay their taxes, and they have to contribute, of course, to the wealth. So we need to stop the greed. We need to stop the extreme credit debt, the risks, the speculation. We need to get decent financing work as it was in the old days, if you like, to make the market to be the true servant. So if we take the next one, yeah. This is about also taking responsibility. You can easily understand that, that with a negative growth rate of 4 to 5 percent on the world scene and minus 6 percent here in the European Union, we need to counteract. Luckily, we have understood that we need to invest to counteract the downturn in this crisis. That is why we are fighting all the time to invest more money in schools, in social structures, in labor market policy, in active labor market policy, in railroads, in, in infrastructure all over the place in Europe and, and worldwide. That is why we have a chance of history to combine it with greening the economy. There's millions of jobs to, to be done and to get uh, in insulation of houses, in creating uh, renewable energy from wind to solar to many, many other things. And, and it's about pushing the decent work and children up at the top of the agenda, and first and foremost, again, massive resources to developing countries. Now, it's time for the new global deal. Uh, I would say it's not coming by itself. By the way, there's, there's an organization out there, AIEJI. I think it's important that you're with us. I think it's important. Because, you know, the governments can do something, but they can't do all. Uh, people can't do all, but they can only do it if they have rooms where they can fold their energy and their solidarity and they're getting together out. And the trade unions, we need them as we need the civil society. So that's why I just want to underline when a lady called me this morning and said, why on earth are you going here to talk to this international organization, uh, AIEJI, why do we do that? And I said to her, because we must make a new globalization. We must make our globalization. We must say today goodbye to the old one and hello to the new one. <laughs> and you know, I, I, I think in a sense it's easy. Let me tell you uh, that last time I had my Congress in, in Europe for the European Socialist and Social Democratic Parties in Porto, my last word at that Congress was about my little grandson, Lucas. He's seven years old now, and he's fantastic. He's a very smart little guy, you know. He always said to me, where are you going now, Paul? I said, I'm going to a meeting, a big, big meeting here in Copenhagen. Is it about saving the world, Paul? Yes, it is. Well, you can go then. <laughs> but, you know, my point was that at the end of this Congress in Porto, I told uh, the audience about six, seven, eight hundred people like here about my grandson Lucas as just a link, you know. And when the light went down, an old man came to me. He was obviously a Jew representing the Labour Party in Israel. He took my hands and he only said one simple thing. You know, Paul, my grandson is also called Lucas. And that's, that's my point. That's why I think, I'm sure, I can feel it, that you and we together can make our globalization because we're the ones who take care about the kids, the children, the children of this world. You see, the strongest, strongest thing existing at all, that is, that is the feeling among people and the feeling for youth and kids. You saw them singing here and you knew your feelings when you not only listened, but also all your imaginations went through your inner cinema. So, so this, is, this is really worldwide. That is what, why I just want to, to finalize my, my few words to you by, by talking about the mentally ill persons in, in, in the world, in Europe, and in this country. To be young and mentally ill, to fight with your inner demons, to live each day in chaos, in isolation, in fear, is not something you can see. 
on this young man or woman. It's not something you can measure in degrees or in centimeters. It's not a broken leg. You're not hit by cancer. You're not hit by, by a bad heart. It's something else. And many, 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 many people don't understand it because we're living in a world now, be it in the developing countries, in Latin America, in Europe, we're living in a world now where, well, let's fix it and then let's move on, right? But if you can't fix it and if you can't see it, you're getting uncertain. The so-called normal people are getting uncertain. What the hell is going on here? The guy is not responding as I expected him normal to do. And, and that is why I really want to say to you that alone in this country here, the richest country in the world, George Bush may not know that, but, but I'm sure Obama know, right? This richest country in the world, friends, half of all the families here, and that is not far away from the European average, half of all the families, they are in touch with the psychiatric system in the country, half, which means that half of all friends, of sisters, of parents, they have a son or a daughter which have been in touch or are in touch with psychiatric systems and advisory systems, which have either a depression, which have a more permanent uh, mentally ill system or systematic illness. You know, we are talking in my mind about the most far-reaching, the vast uh, type of modern society sickness we have, we have ever done. That's why I want to invest a couple of my lifetime more in, in doing what I can do for, for these people. And that's why I'm so happy to be here with you because I know that you know what it is about. I just want to make four points, four simple points. Number one, we must never ever treat mentally ill people like, like in a way that, like the parents and the friends are being told, please stay away, we will fix it. Parents and friends and love must never be isolated from our way of taking care of mentally ill people. There has been a tendency to do that. Number two, we must never believe that medical treatment is the only way. Medical treatment is a part of it for some, but not for all. And we must understand, three, that the most important thing, the worst, worst enemy of mentally ill people, that is loneliness and isolation. That is why I'm so happy of what you are doing, each of you. I'm so thankful because dealing with people in the way you are dealing with it is the most valuable thing you can ever do. And, and I want to say to you that mentally ill people, they need three thi simple things. Number one, that there's a coherence in their daily life. That, that they are not split up. If you are meeting five challenges you have to take, to take point on, a decision on in a day, you can't do it if you are having, having really troubles in your inner cinema. You need to have a quiet, good day, coherent. There needs to be coherence all the time. And you need to have people you can talk with, people who have, who have uh, tolerance, people who never give up with you. And you need to understand that people understand you. So the evil circles you need to break. That's why many young people, when they meet their mother and they know that their mother is suffering to see them suffering, they are getting even more suffering because they can't break the evil circle. So I'm back to basis. I'm saying to you, the most fantastic job you can have is to try to take care of these people. And I tell you one thing more. We people in the richer part of the world, we are so we have been so focused on money, yeah? You know this this you know it yourself, this rise of price in your real estate in your house, right? Oh my god, I'm getting I'm getting 100,000 euros richer without doing anything this year compared to last year. Oh my God, it's fantastic, isn't it? Well, until yesterday it was fantastic. Now it's going the other way around, doesn't it? <laughs> my point is that these so-called free add value to your houses is nothing compared to what you can obtain by talking with these people. If you're getting a chance to get access to a mentally ill young man or woman, get access, talk and see in there, in there where only you can get access, you will see a little flame of hope becoming 
bigger. And you can leave this conversation by the feeling that you have done just a little bit to give this human being some hope. To give these people a feeling that, oh my God, they, they need me too. They need me too. I can do something too. That is fantastic. And then they can come with all their add values to their houses, put it together. It's nothing compared to this one here. So shared care and recovery is truly one of the most important things we need to do. So friends, you have the finest job in the world because you're dealing with people, because you're helping our children, because you're creating hope for a decent life, because you're helping the poorest, the excluded, the misfits, because you're doing things which you not necessarily have to do, but you're doing it, uh, and, and that is so fantastic. And we have one basic value, which is universal, that every, every human being counts, that every human being can do something, that there's a need for every human being only because this is a human being, and that what we can do is to create the frame so that each individual human being can find out what, what is the, the person good at, if you understand. Everyone have a talent. It's only a question of finding it and giving the opportunity to find it to the individual. So that's why people come first, and that's why it's time for our children's agenda, time to connect. And time to connect as effective as these Wall Street guys. Let's show them that they don't have monopoly on connecting worldwide. They don't have monopoly on the internet. They don't have monopoly on the conversation because they deal with money. This is only short-sighted. We deal with people. That's the eternal thing. Thank you so much, and have a good Congress to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs>